uh, we would like to welcome all the participants and the pa the panelists today for this uh, inaugural webinar of this uh, we uh, dr truptesh and i say myself we have uh, kind of uh, envisioned which me which is called east meets west so basically the idea in this webinar and this uh, session is that we have you know two uh, faculty from the east and two faculty from the west and we will be taking up one topic which is going to be of you know great interest and basically a technique oriented topic so today's topic is on selective cannulation and we have uh, the title of the uh, session today is finding the correct path at crossroads so basically we'll have dr amit maidev and dr haber to speak on the uh, on this and then of course we have dr rangsan from uh, and dr uzma who is who are going to be moderators so i would like to welcome all these four you know faculty today thank you so much for sparing your time so <clears throat> uh, we will start the session with dr amit maidev's uh, lecture now dr amit maidev does not require any formal introduction i think he's been a, he's a global figure in endoscopy he's been that for the last 25 years i am i am i can proudly say that you know he's been my mentor and teacher where when i learned endoscopy and whatever you know we are doing endoscopy today is thanks to dr maidev dr maidev currently is the chairman of the baldota institute of digestive sciences at the global hospitals in mumbai and he has to his credit a whole list of you know accolades and awards and so many of them that it would probably take up the time of this webinar but just to you know in short he has received the padma shri which is the second um, highest civilian award in india and he has been a teacher and a mentor to probably n number of endoscopists globally and the moderator from the east is dr rangsan rakmitar who is the chairman and who is the head of department of uh, Digestive uh, endoscopy and the uh, gastroenterology at the King Chilalongkorn University Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand. Dr. Rangsan has been a close friend and colleague for the last many years, and he is an ex he is a fantastic uh, endoscopist with special interest in ERCP, and uh, he has also been. involved in the la in last many decades for you know in teaching a lot of trainees and fellows in endoscopy and interventional endoscopy and particularly ERCP and welcome rangsan thank you. you i know that you are on vacation and thanks for sparing time despite you being on vacation for this meeting Cups so, on Santan now i just went for hiking this morning <laughs> thank you and now i would like to invite dr truptesh kotari who is my co host today to introduce and to welcome the speakers from the west so this is how it's going to work so truptesh over to you good morning guys uh, for all the folks in uh, the west and uh, it took us some time to cannulate the bile duct but again finally we got in uh, as per dr greg haber who happens to be my mentor and uh, i call him the mo the master of endoscopy So, Dr. Haber, as Dr. Mehdev, he doesn't need any introduction. He is the Tom Cruise of uh, the West, and he is the professor and uh, Department of Medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and is also the Chief of Endoscopy. And coming on to our esteemed uh, moderator, a well-known endoscopist, a powerful woman in GI, is Dr. Uzma Siddiqui. She is a professor of medicine and the director. for the center for endoscopic research and uh, therapeutics and also the advanced endoscopy training in university of chicago so i welcome both of you uh, and they they are we are very proud we are representing the west and this is a very um, innovative creative idea by dr amol bapia and uh, myself that every time we go to a conference we hear a lot of data 
but the attendings uh, and the attendees who want to learn the basics from the experts and also the esteemed uh, moderators, throwing them questions and asking them scenarios where the experts can answer the questions, what, how do they do in their practice from East as well as West? So that was the concept. And uh, I would uh, have, uh, it's my privilege to invite Dr. Mehdev to start the uh, 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 talk and then followed by Dr. Mehdev will be Dr. Greg Haber and followed by that Dr. Uzma Siddiqui and Dr. Rangsen can take over for moderation. So over to you, Dr. Mehdev. Yeah, okay, I'll just share my slides. And uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate Amol as well as Truptesh for this brilliant idea of coming up with this concept of East meets West on the basic concepts of endoscopy. And uh, today's topic is uh, even more interesting because uh, as all of you know that uh, selective biliary and pancreatic cannulation uh, is uh, one of the holy grails for a person who's beginning ERCP. Uh, so I'm gonna start my talk today and um, I will share my thoughts with you. Uh, so as all of us know that the ampule of waiter is a very elusive organ. And uh, most of us who have done ERCPs will realize and will admit that the faces of the ampulla are as different as, as you can see the faces of people. And every time you do a ERCP, every time you'll find a different type of an ampulla waiter. And in fact, because of this, from a beginner's perspective, the ampulla waiter can be considered as a small, delicate organ situated in darkness and surrounded by vital structures. And this is the first and the basic hurdle because once you get across the ampulla waiter inside the bile duct or the pancreatic duct, further therapy is usually not a problem. The main hurdle is this from the beginner's perspective. Well, in fact, because of the varied manifestations and the appearances of the ampulla waiter, uh, uh, recently there have been some publications. You can see this recent publication in 2021 and uh, where they have seen the difficulty in cannulation, which can depend upon the type of ampulla waiter you see. And in this classification, they have divided the types of ampulla waiter in type one, type two A, two B, two C, and three A, three B, and four. Now, what this paper basically says is that if you have a ampulla like this, that is type one, which is flat, uh, you have a success rate of cannulation of around 93.6, type two B, you see here 96.9, which is a quite high success rate, which is a prominent ampulla tubular, but non-pleated. That means there is no fold above it, no covering fold. Type 2B is a prominent tubular ampulla, but with a covering fold. And this is, of course, the easiest ampulla to cannulate. Type 2C, prominent bulging ampulla, which is almost 100% success rate. Then you have got intradiverticular ampulla 3A, 92.9%, type 3B, that is uh, ampulla on the edge of a diverticulum, which is the lowest, that is 85.7% success. And of course, unclassified, because as I told you, uh, you can't cover all the ampulla waiter in any classification. Uh, there is no wonder, therefore, that uh, the master of endoscopy, master of ERCP, Peter Cotton, way back in 91, had said that ERCP can be sometimes 99% perspiration especially for a, a beginner. Uh, traditionally speaking, if you were to ask me before we began our training 30 years back, I'm sure even Greg will agree with me that the traditional technique of cannulating the ampule of waiter was more uh, arbitrary or uh, uh, using a cannula where we that time did not use a sphincterotome and any type of glide wires or guide wires. And the main technique was to push the cannula in the orifice and then keep on pushing it in different directions, try to rectify the position and actually try to ram yourself way inside the bile duct or the pancreatic duct. Now this way, uh, cannulation used to be most of the times accidental rather than intentional. And therefore many times such type of cannulation, you just go in, try to inject some contrast, create some edema, try to keep on pushing more. It was associated with failure as well as complications. Now, why is this? The main reason is that if you clearly see the, understand the anatomy of the ampulla as well as the lower CBD, 
you can see here that the ampulla is quite a complex organ with multiple sphincters, so many muscle fibers here and there. And you see here the course of the bile duct as it comes down, it comes down vertically. Then it courses a little bit horizontally over here and then again vertically down towards the orifice. Whereas the pancreatic duct goes relatively straight from the ampullary orifice. In fact, this is a ERCP picture, which clearly demonstrates this S-shaped lower end of the bile duct. You see coming down, then horizontal, and then vertical. Whereas pancreatic is, is, is relatively straight to cannulate. So therefore, if you want to achieve a successful and a safe cannulation of the bile duct, uh, or the pancreatic duct, prefer especially the bile duct, you should follow a standard protocol. First is a standard technique of cannulation. With that, if you don't succeed, then you should try a technique of cannulation with the glide wire. Nowadays, we start directly with the glide wire. Now, sometimes you have to modify the technique depending upon the type of ampulla. You may have to modify the technique because of some events which may occur during the cannulation. Like for example, you are uh, caused a little edema during cannulation or your guide wire is repeatedly entered the pancreatic duct. And of course, you should be ready with some technique if all the traditional methods fail. And you should also know in case there is a patient of surgically altered anatomy, how to approach the ampulla. Now, if you were to see, there are two things which have changed. Well, number one is now we have now sort of rectified and uh, come to a conclusion as to which is the most ideal position of the endoscope to bring the ampulla in such a position which is ideal for cannulation, especially of the bile duct. You see here, uh, many times we have a tendency of uh, completely straightening the scope, whereby the ampulla comes very close to the scope, it is very end on, and sometimes cannulation can be difficult. If you do a complete long loop position, where that also can make your scope stable, but positioning or passing instruments can become difficult. The ampulla doesn't come in the right position. So the ideal position is like this. You push in a little bit, little bit semi-long loop position, not too much long loop, just push in slightly so that the scope becomes stable. At the same time, the ampulla comes in front of you. Rarely, if the ampulla or the duodenum is deformed, we may have to perform the entire cannulation in a long loop position. What has drastically changed is the introduction of glide wires. See, now there are two types of hydrophilic glide wires. One is these shaft tip, uh, the, the stiff wires, which have got hydrophilic tip, or you have got completely hydrophilic wires, which are like the cherumo, or what you call as the radio focus wires. Now, if you see here, what is the traditional technique of cannulation? So what we do is, you can do it in three stages, even without using a glide wire. If you have a nice bulging ampulla, like the 2B type, as you saw in the classification. Number one is to engage the tip of your sphincterotome in the orifice of the ampulla. So number one is for CBD cannulation, because this is a curved pathway, because you have to lift the roof of the ampulla better, it's better to use a curved instrument rather than a straight instrument. So nowadays, most of the endoscopists prefer to start with a sphincterotome rather than a cannula. So number one is to engage into the orifice. Number two is pull the entire shaft of the scope up by this, what happens is this S shaped of the lower end of the bile duct becomes straight. And then number three, once the S shape becomes straight, you bring the big wheel of the scope near by which this directly enters inside the bile duct. So this is exactly what we do. So bring the big wheel near and bring the scope tip near. So this is the traditional technique of cannulation. And this is how it is done. For example, you bring the ampulla at 11 to 12 o'clock position. I usually try to caress and touch the ampulla just to make sure, engage into the orifice, bend the sphincterotome, bring the big wheel near. Now, this is a very cakewalk. This is very easy, but this is not so easy in every case. So nowadays, most of the endoscopists start cannulating by using a glide wire. So what do we do is, you can see here, you bring the ampulla into the right position. Then you expose the orifice of the ampulla by gently lifting that fold, which is covering it and properly inspect this area. Because you can see here, this is like peels of an onion. Now, if you go into a different place, you will just go into the layers of the ampulla rather than entering the bile duct. So first identify, then in your mind, you imagine the which direction the bile duct is coursing. And the next step to do is to bring out your glide wire. And just to show you what this glide wire can do, from outside, you can actually rotate this glide wire. So if you bring and go inside the orifice with the glide wire, then 
correct the axis towards the bile duct and, and then if the assistant gently rotates and pushes the glide wire it will go across you can see here where i have cannulated this small orifice above not below so over here now you gently bend the swing protome bring, bring it towards the axis and now my assistant is rotating the glide wire you see and this is how the glide wire itself goes across the lower s shape of the bile duct inside the uh, uh, inside the bile duct deeply well if you were to see there have been some studies uh, of contrast versus glide wire assisted cannulation it was a meta analysis of 4 5 and 7 and 12 randomized control trials which have clearly stated and shown that there is a much higher success of cannulation if you use a glide wire assisted technique rather than just a cannula with a contrast assisted technique well how do you modify the technique if depending upon the type of ampulla suppose you have a low placed ampulla with a covering fold like a type 2b so what you do in this situation is to lift the overlying fold to expose the ampullary orifice then you drop the elevator so that the swing protome goes down and then you gently engage it into the tip and after which you bend the swing protome towards the axis of the cbd and the next step is the assistant starts rotating the glide wire so this is a simple step so you have to elevate the roof and then engage the tip and then rotate the glide wire after bringing the swing protome in the axis of the cbd what happens in a deformed duodenum again according to the type of ampulla you have a flat ampulla with a difficult and a deformed duodenum so now see here use a fluoroscopic picture i'm passing the duodenoscope through the stomach now going across the pylorus uh, this is a uh, sub, uh, uh, simultaneous endoscopic picture you see here this is the ampulla now now gently we pass it a little bit deeper now i'm turning the small wheel right straightening the scope and then i tried pulling the scope backward trying to straighten it completely i am not getting the ampulla in a perfect position for cannulation it's too near and it's still little bit oblong so in such a situation what i am going to do is now i'm going to keep on pushing the scope a little bit uh, before that i tried to cannulate with this glide wire uh, the direction is not coming proper the axis is not coming proper in spite of rotation of the glide wire so the next step uh, what to do is to push the scope in a long loop position so what has happened now is by pushing the scope in a long loop position now i've got the ampulla in a perfect axis and again now we use the tip of the glide wire go here rectify this axis and now the assistant starts rotating the wire and you'll see here by rotating the small wheel slightly to the left now you have come into the right direction and the glide wire enters inside the bile duct so this is the what you have to do in case you find a difficult position deformed duodenum sometimes you have to do it in a semi long loop position another extremely important difficulty which we may face is if there is an associated periampulary diverticulum you see here there has been a recent systemic review and meta analysis on ercp outcomes and periampulary diverticuli 16 studies more than 2700 patients and they have found that the difficulty of cannulation is 50% higher if there is a periampulary diverticulum but uh, what is very alarming to see is that in spite of a diverticulum the chances of pancreatitis bleeding perforation and cholangitis are not increased so don't worry about that but difficulty can definitely increase so we have to use a number of different tricks so what happens if the ampulla is inside the diverticulum this is actually the easiest here the only problem is the orifice is low down so what we need to do is we are going to first palpate just see where the bile duct is coursing inside the ampulla now i'm going to again drop my elevator open my elevator drop my swing protome so that the swing protome tip can be engaged properly in the orifice engage it properly now bend it when i bend it what happens is this ampulla becomes relatively straight and now the axis is along the roof of the ampulla and this becomes very easy so once you bend it and then you rotate the glide wire it will enter inside the bile duct what happens over here if the ampulla is rotated and it's uh, located towards one side of the diverticulum here what we do now is now here i'm not going to use the swing protome because the swing protome will take me in a completely different direction so i'm using a cannula and use the tip of the cannula as a fulcrum so i'm going to engage the tip of the cannula in the orifice of this rotated ampulla and then after keeping the tip engaged i'm gently rotating my small wheel to the right see what happened as soon as i did that my cannula came into the right axis of the bile duct and it easily entered inside the bile duct even without the use of a 
glide wire. So this is what you have to do. So you have to keep on changing your technique depending upon the type of ampulla you see. This is one of the most difficult cannulations which you can see where the ampulla is on the edge rotated inside the diverticulum where you need to use a very special technique which is called the pull and push technique. So here what we do, I'm trying to cannulate, nothing is going inside, we are going in a different direction. So I'm using a baby biopsy forceps. Catch the fold and pull the ampulla out of the diverticulum and fix the ampulla, keep the baby biopsy forceps there. So the ampulla is facing here and now by the side of the baby biopsy forceps, we pass a sphinx protome and that gives us a perfect direction to go inside the bile duct. So this is a technique which we can use. Sometimes we can also utilize uh, hemoclips. We can just pull the ampulla out, fix it with hemoclips on the side so that the ampullary orifice faces towards you and then you can cavitate. it. Now, what happens uh, by, as I told you, if, he, if some events happen during cannulation, like your guide wire keeps on entering inside the pancreatic duct. One of the techniques is to use a double guide wire technique. So here, what we do is we leave the guide wire inside, as you can see here in the pancreatic duct, and then either just put a pancreatic stent, and then by the side of that, you try to go on that 11 o'clock position uh, with a swing protome and try to find the bile duct. This can be sometimes difficult because if you put a stent, the ampullary orifice can get closed and you have no space by the side of the stent to pass in a glide wire as well as your sphinx protome. So here, sometimes you can just leave the guide wire inside, keep the guide wire pushed down so that the pancreas gets separated from the bile duct and then try to gently probe on the left side of your glide wire, guide wire which has entered the pancreatic duct. So now I've gone on the left side of your pancreatic guide wire and then Again, you start rotating your glide wire to enter inside the bile duct. By uh, a few attempts, you can see here now, if you get into the right axis, keep on pushing the pancreatic wire down to separate the pancreatic ductal orifice. And here you can see now, uh, with the pancreatic wire inside, now our wire has entered inside the bile duct. And then after doing your biliary sphincterotomy, maybe you can place a prophylactic pancreatic stent. The other option, of course, we have here is... Uh, uh, to do a transpancreatic pre-cut. Now, this is what we can do. That means even if your guide wire has entered into the pancreatic duct, leave the guide wire inside. Over that pancreatic wire itself, you put a sphincterotome and then orient the wire of your sphincterotome towards the 11 o'clock position. And then just keep on cutting through the pancreas towards the direction of the bile duct. Now, this appears to be a very dangerous technique because looking at it, it looks like that you may create pancreatitis. In fact, uh, uh, initially when this technique was described, uh, we decided not to practice it because this can be associated with pancreatitis, but recently there have been some papers which have shown that in fact, this technique has proven to be better than even double guide wire cannulation. So after doing a transpancreatic pre you see here, there's some amount of bile which is coming out because we have cut the bile duct over here. So the first thing to do is to place a pancreatic stent now uh, because you have already cut through the pancreatic, uh, the pancreas and bile duct septum and then on the left side of the stent, because you have already done a small cut at the place where you can see that drop of bile, that is the place you cannulate with your sphinx protome and enter inside the bile duct. You can see the direction of the pancreatic stent is in this direction. You have to go towards the left. And this way you can quite easily enter inside. Now, what happens if all the traditional techniques fail? Then we use a classic pre-cut. So I'm going to describe to you how a classic pre-cut is done by using a needle knife sphinx protome. All these techniques of cannulation have been attempted and this is not successful. So now I'm using a needle knife sphincterotome. I usually start the pre-cut sphincterotomy by starting from the orifice of the ampulla and going upwards at 11 to 12 o'clock direction along the bulging portion of the CBD. And the main thing to do in a pre-cut is to do layer by layer de-roofing of the ampulla waiter. So please mark this uh, external camera picture where I'm holding the shaft of the scope to keep the position very stable. And at the same time, with my left thumb, I'm moving the wheel, big wheel up and down and the elevator up and down. So only a layer by layer incision, you should not do too deep an incision. It should be like a surgical incision. And you see here, after the first layer is cut, I'm pushing the layers away so as to expose the deeper layers, gently probe and see where is the bulge, and then again, start cutting from lower down and cut the next layer. So this is exactly like how you do surgery. So now, after exposing that bulging portion, I know I've got in my mind which direction I have to go. Again, I take out the needle knife 
and I start cut, start cutting somewhere over here, and I, now I'm going to cut in this direction. You see here now, I've engaged the tip over here, very, very gentle cut, very gentle cut, keep on cutting up, and after that is done, again, you withdraw the needle, expose that area, and gently inspect. I'm sure all of you must be already seeing where the bile duct opening is, it is somewhere over here. It has revealed itself. The salmon pink epithelium of the bile duct usually reverses itself. It's usually over here. You can see my cursor. And here now, after you have done this intentional pre-cut, very easily you can enter inside the bile duct. Now, this is the exact technique of what you have to do. And once you have mastered the pre-cut, actually, your success of annulation can reach almost 100%. What happens if the pre-cut is not done properly? And this is what happens sometimes. You have cut in all different directions and the ampulla is completely damaged. And you see here, this is a tampered ampulla waiter. And the only thing we can do, instead of just keeping on attempting at uh, unknown locations, it's better to go on from the known to the unknown. So this is an ideal situation where we can use the EUS guided rendezvous approach. So uh, through the duodenum, we puncture the bile duct. And then we take a guide wire, usually use hydrophilic guide wire, go from above downwards, get the wire across out of the ampulla waiter. And once the wire is got out of the ampulla, you catch that wire, pull it out. And over that wire, we can railroad a sphincterotome and we can complete the procedure. Well, uh, certain uh, situations like surgically altered anatomy, you can see here, uh, this is a patient who's undergone RYGB for obesity. And you have got this uh, remnant stomach over here and this patient has developed CBD stones. So why we can do this procedure, which is called as the edge procedure, where we have punctured the stomach under US guidance through the stomach, uh, small uh, mini gastric bypass, the small stomach, which is there. We have seen this remnant stomach outside. We have filled now water inside it. And inside this, we place a lumen opposing metal stent. And after we place the lumen opposing metal stent, we fix this metal stent by using a overstitch device so that the stent does not dislocate. And then through the stent, we can pass a duodenoscope and complete our ERCP procedure by reaching the second part of the duodenum. Uh, now, finally, only last two videos on how to cannulate the pancreatic duct. It's relatively easy, unless, of course, you have got a stricture in the juxtapapillary region, or if you have got a patient who has got stones which are impacted in the juxtapapillary region. But otherwise, Pancreatic duct cannulation, I usually start by using a cannula rather than a spin protocol because it's a straight approach. And the direction is from above downwards and from left to the right. You see over there, from left to the right, from above downwards, and this is how you can cannulate the major papilla uh, in a patient who has got pancreatic endotherapy required. Uh, what is more important to learn is how to cannulate the minor papilla in patients who have pancreas divism. And just to show you the technique, what we do over here is minor papilla is usually located proximal to the major papilla. And uh, for this to get into your proper position, we have to usually use a semi-long look position. You can see the minor papilla over here. As we are going inside, this is the major papilla. Well, what we do is, now when we straighten the scope, sometimes it's very difficult to bring the minor, minor papilla into an end-on position for cannulation. So to bring the minor papilla in an end-on position, what we do is we keep on pushing the scope and bring it into a long loop position. And as you keep on pushing the scope over here, now you see I'm pushing the scope inside. You see here the loop is forming in the stomach here on the fluoroscopy picture. And as we are doing that, the minor papilla will automatically come end-on, the ideal position for cannulation. Now what I personally do is I use a special minor papilla uh, a cannula, which has got a, almost like a metal metallic needle tip by which I cannulate the minor papilla first and I dilate the minor papillary orifice by using this paper tip, metal tip minor papilla cannula. So what I'm going to do now is going to use the, the taper tip minor papilla cannula. See how it is look, sees, looks here. Now with this very, very gently in the orifice of the minor papilla, we cannulate and I opacify. You can see that this is a complete pancreas divism. Now, after that, I'm going to move this cannula in and out a little bit so that the orifice gets a little dilated. It's a tapered cannula, wedge-shaped cannula. And once that is done, then I start using a glide wire. And with a glide wire now, you can easily enter into this orifice. And then for that, you can do a minor papilla sphincterotomy and then maybe uh, place a prophylactic pancreatic stent, especially in a condition like this. 
where the patient has recurrent acute pancreatitis with the pancreas division. This is what we do. Very rarely, if the minor papilla also is very difficult to cannulate, then sometimes, and if this patient has got a, a persistent duct of Santorini, what we call as uh, incomplete pancreas division, uh, when we can go through the major papilla and rotate this glide wire, you can see that there is some connection to the minor papilla over here, over here. So I'm going to pass this glide wire through the major papilla and my assistant rotates this glide wire in such a way that it comes out through the minor papilla. You can see here now I'm rotating it and then this wire is coming out through the minor papilla. And now this wire we are going to catch and railroad it. You can see the wire coming out through the minor. So this wire now we will catch and then we will over this wire, we are going to railroad a sphinx protocol and complete our therapy. Uh, so by this, now you will realize that in spite of the varying phases of the ampulla waiter, uh, we can overcome most of these difficulties if you follow a proper regime. Well, therefore, uh, 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 everyone who's attending this seminar, I'm quite sure those of you who are interested in learning selective biliary and pancreatic cannulation, the take home message is, uh, number one is obviously a proper patient selection. It is very, very important that you should have a proper understanding of the ampullary and ductal anatomy. Keep it in your mind. Uh, you should use proper instruments. When to use a sphinx protome? If your sphinx protome is turning to the right, correct the, rectify the position beforehand before you start your ERCP. Uh, you should know. You should have a proper meticulous and extremely gentle technique because the ampulla waiter is a complex organ. You cannot keep on pushing arbitrarily, otherwise there will be edema and you will create complications and failure. You should have a timely modification of the technique if your approach is difficult. And of course, if nothing uh, succeeds, then you should stage the procedure, not keep on trying and create a complication and call the patient back a few days later again for a repeat procedure. So thanks for your attention. All right, Amit, that was a fantastic uh, masterclass on cannulation from the East. Hopefully, uh, Dr. Haber can keep up with you um, and uh, show us how the West does it. Thanks very much, Uzma. And um, also, congratulations to uh, Triptesh and Amol. This is um, a great launch to a great concept. And uh, it's interesting as I'm listening to uh, Amit's uh, comprehensive and, and exquisite presentation of cannulation. I realize we have, you know, a very similar mindset, but I think we have somewhat different approaches, which I'll try to emphasize uh, being uh, the second person to present here. So just give me a moment so I can share my screen. Meanwhile, we'll take all the questions from the participants uh, once we have case discussion done by Dr. Siddiqui and Dr. Rangsan. So stay tuned. Apologize for this. Just take me a moment. You can check my email if you like while I'm doing this. Uh, there we go. Okay. So just, just a little bit of a backdrop. Um, I work uh, in uh, New York City at uh, NYU, um, which is one of the sort of uh, three or four major medical centers uh, in, uh, in the city. Um, we have a therapeutic endoscopy program with um, about five uh, advanced endoscopists and two advanced fellows. And uh, so we, uh, uh, that's, that's where I, I've been for the last uh, five years. Um, my backdrop to ERCP is that uh, I started off in Toronto, uh, where I spent um, actually uh, close to 25 years um, doing uh, therapeutic endoscopy with the Toronto group. And similarly, uh, we had an advanced endoscopy group there. But what was different in Canada was that uh, we had very uh, low or very few uh, advanced endoscopists. So we had a funnel system where virtually all of the ERCPs, especially in the pre-MRCP era, funneled down to one center in Toronto where I worked. So I had the benefit of uh, 
you know, putting about 30,000 uh, ERCPs under my belt uh, before I moved to New York. Uh, well, uh, similarly to uh, Amit, I think, you know, the, the critical issue with uh, cannulation is understanding the anatomy. You know, God created the papilla in a certain way. As long as we understand how it was created and uh, the, the basic anatomy of the papilla, I think that everybody can accomplish cannulation. Um, the things we notice with our fellows when we're trying to teach them is that they often sort of just take whatever direction they can get to uh, lodge the uh, cannula or the sphincter tome into the mouth of the papilla. And in doing so, they often distort the native anatomy. So I think that it's critical, and I'll show this as we go along with the videos, that we avoid distortion. Try to adapt to whatever shape or morphology that papilla has or that duodenum has. So our challenge as endoscopists is to control the scope to um, align ourselves with the natural axis of that papilla to cannulate that duct, as we've seen illustrated so well in the previous lecture. And then understanding your accessories, how to use them, et cetera. So what is the best tool to accomplish the task at hand? Um, oops, let's go to the next. So one of the problems I have is that um, uh, when we see the anatomic drawings of the papilla, and we'll put these up here, it shows sort of a natural smooth arcing of the bile duct down to the papillary orifice. And you can see this in the netter diagrams and the anatomic diagrams from Gray's Anatomy or whatever books that you've used. And I think this is the wrong concept. The problem with this drawing, it shows a smooth arcing. And Amit pointed this out in his lecture as well, is that really you have to look at two different directions to cannulate. There's the vertical direction going up, which is this direction, obviously, oops. Um, and then a transverse direction when you cross the muscularis propria of the duodenal wall. Just remember that the biliary sphincter, the pancreatic sphincter are really just extensions of the muscularis propria. And that really we have to cross in a transverse direction, more so with the bile duct, and so it's a sigmoid curve that you take to get up to cannulate the bile duct. Um, and so I think this, what I call the geometry of cannulation, I think this is a critical concept that will help you get into the bile duct. Consider yourself cannulating, first of all, the papillary uh, mound, if you like, which is more vertical. And then we have to do a transverse direction and then back to the vertical direction. So what I call the geometry of cannulation. This is an important concept when you're trying to cannulate. And here you see when we use a sphincter atome or uh, basically that we can alter the direction, this shows you how you can bow the sphincter atome to do the first vertical. You unbow and, and, and pull the scope back a little bit to do the transverse passage. And then you can rebow to get into the bile duct or pass a wire. So that's, those are the basics. The other thing to remember is what I call papillary anatomy. So you're not cannulating one orifice. You're cannulating really three different orifices. First of all, what I consider the mucosal orifice, which is what you see to the naked eye when you're in the duodenum. Endoscopically, you can see that you do not see the sphincteric orifices. And the sphincter orifice do not align with the mucosal orifice. So when that happens, you're gonna go in what looks like a very straight entry point into the mucosal orifice. But your next challenge is to line that up with the sphincter orifice. And depending on whether you're going for the bile duct or the pancreatic duct, you're gonna go up to the 10 to 12 o'clock direction more vertically, or you're gonna go more horizontally in the 12 to two o'clock direction. So you have to line up the orifice of the duct of choice with the, um, uh, the mucosal orifice. So just keep that in mind 
as you do your cannulation. Now, the other concept to have in mind before you start is the length of the common channel or where the septum exists behind that papillary mound. And there's no way you can know this uh, by uh, duodenoscopic view. So obviously on the left, you have a longer common channel here, um, which is you know, up to 10 millimeters. If we go beyond 15, we have an anomalous junction. Or here we have uh, sort of a somewhat less common septum that comes very close to the mucosal orifice. And rarely we see two separate orifices on the mucosal surface. This is less than 5% of the, probably like 1% of the time. But when we cannulate, the mistake that fellows make and the mistake that beginners make is that they think that we're always living with this first diagram. And they think when the cannula or the sphincterotome is already engaged in the pancreas, all they have to do is bow up or change direction and that will take them in the bile duct. That rarely works because this looks like it's a big space to change direction, but in reality, you're dealing with um, one or two millimeters. So when you cannulate selectively, I think you have to imagine that that septum comes almost out to the mucosal orifice. So if you want to change direction, you've got to pull out almost completely or bow up so the tip of your sphincterotome is right at the edge of the mucosal orifice. So again, the mistake I see the fellows make all the time, they get into the pancreas, oh, I'll just bow up and I'll get into the bile duct. It doesn't happen because that you don't realize you're committed and that septum is going to prevent you from getting into the bile duct. So you have to withdraw almost to the mucosal orifice. So that's an important lesson. The third thing about anatomy is that if you look at actual uh, representation of the mucosal surface and the crevices uh, of and the mucosal variation, if you like, within the papilla, you can see that you can easily get locked into a small uh, bay, if you like, or a small branch duct uh, within the papilla, believe it or not. Or you can, of course, if you're in the pancreas, you go into a branch duct just behind the papilla. So you have to remember that when you're trying to cannulate. So the basics, again, this video, it, it's so reminiscent of what Amit said, because I think our minds are very much alike. The first thing we're doing is looking at the axis, trying to understand the native anatomy, which, where does that intraduodenal bulge representing the bile duct, what is the axis of that? And then we try to align our cannulating device and 99% of the time, of course, the sphincter at all. Now, here you see it with the wire, which is what we use, we're in the bile duct. So bowing up and drawing back, pulling back, back, back. So only the tip of the sphincter tone is at mucosal orifice, even out of sight, often out of sight. But you almost feel that sort of pop into the bile duct, and then you go in. So the, the, the trick is be gentle, um, uh, you know, Carefully pull back when you're in the in the pancreas, and carefully uh, bow up. Use your elevator, or you use the sphincter tome to get into the biliary direction. Now, um, as was mentioned earlier, there's no question. I think in my mind, uh, and I think there are people who are experienced uh, endoscopists who, who still feel that uh, contrast is is the first way to uh, find the bile duct, but most of us use the guide wire technique. Now, a, a difference that we have, we don't use, and I noticed, uh, Amit, in your talk, you almost universally used a glide wire with lo what looked like an angled tip glide wire. And you always mentioned that your assistant was critical in finding the duct or rotating and whatever. Now, I think that the East is different than the West. In the East, you have, I would say, sort of more career path assistants who are extremely experienced and could almost do what we do as endoscopists. In the West, we deal with a different, I would say, endoscopy setup. 
where they rotate all kinds of different assistants and nurses through different rooms. The idea being that almost anybody can do anything, which of course is not the case. But what that does is that forces us as endoscopists in the West to you know, really control the wire ourselves, And we don't use glide wires as a rule because they're more difficult to handle. Of course, you have to have, they're hydrophilic, you have to use water, you have to sometimes use a vice grip, whatever, but you need more care and attention with a glide wire. It gives you somewhat more control, but we don't have, I would say, that luxury. And in the West, if we look at, uh, for instance, this uh, trial from Lauren Lane from uh, uh, New Haven, what they showed was that um, if the assistant controlled the wire, there was a higher rate of pancreatitis compared to the endoscopist controlling the wire. And this was statistically significant with a very, very low number of cases. So you can imagine it's a great difference. So there's a little difference between East and West as to who controls the wire. So the wire that I use, something more easily controlled. So I'll use not a hydrophilic, of course, all the wires have hydrophilic tips, and we can use different variations in the, in the tip between VisiGlide 1, VisiGlide 2, um, revolution wires, whatever the wires we are, we use. But we basically like to control that ourselves in the West. Now, um, here's a case I'm gonna show you because um, in this particular case, uh, this was just done this week. So my new fellow was training and I'm gonna give you an example, just sorry, I'm gonna get this going here. So the new fellow was training and we're giving him all the tips and clues that I, I've discussed with you earlier about the anatomy, adapting, trying to get underneath that upper lip, bow up for the, for the bile duct. Of course, he's trying all these different maneuvers and not getting in. But as he injects, you can see in the right panel, we're getting intramural, oops, no, I'm sorry. Uh, there we go. Where do I just uh, adjust this? We're getting intramural injection on the right. And that is another challenge I'll show you. There we go. And you can see uh, once he starts injecting and you get a bulging or an intramural injection, you can see that on the left. You can see the edema of the wall. So we have to adapt to whatever we're faced with. And so at, at this point, um, he again put the wire and injecting with it. Oh, I said, oh, you know, that looks like the bile duct there. I think we may be getting the bile duct. I think you're through. And lo and behold, as we continue, we realize that this is not going up a duct, but it's an extension of the intramural injection. So, you know, this is what, you know, training programs are like, how do we adapt? What do we do when this happens? This can happen to a fellow, can happen to um, a less experienced endoscopist or even an experienced endoscopist. So, you know, we took over and the thing to do here, which is a lesson as to how to handle it, is that we then go ahead and we have to, that, that intramural injection gives you protection. So you can cut through that mucosal plane without, with very little worry, about any damage to other structures. So we're gonna cut through that intramural injection. And notice when I take over, I'm gonna focus on that transverse plane crossing the muscularis propria through the biliary sphincter and not go up to the apex, but go across the uh, duodenal wall. And then we have successful bile duct cannulation. So um, I guess the question always arises, especially when we're training fellows, or when we're doing it ourselves, at what point should we think about an alternative method? In other words, um, is it time? Is it cannulation attempts, et cetera? There are many different definitions of what is considered uh, a difficult uh, cannulation. I think most people would accept that if you go more than five minutes, certainly more than seven minutes uh, attempting, if you enter the pancreatic duct, some people consider one entry with the wire into the pancreatic duct as uh, a difficult cannulation. When we're using fellows, we accept up to three wire entries into the uh, pancreatic duct or five cannulation attempts. And then of course, if there's distorted anatomy, uh, we have to look at alternative methods. So um, if you look here, for instance, at the complication rate, this was just published last year. 
This is on over a thousand uh, ERCPs. We can see that um, if the cannulation occurred in under three minutes on the left panel, the uh, pancreatitis rate was 1.4%. If it went to three to five minutes, up to 3.9%. But once we got over five minutes, up to an average of 11.8%, and even higher if in that uh, time uh, duration, there was cannulation of the pancreatic duct. So time and the amount of time we give our fellows is critical as to when we take over or when we consider the options of how else to cannulate. So what are the options? And you, again, this is going to be a little bit redundant, but hopefully some of the points will stick when you hear them three or four times. Um, but basically, <clears throat> we go to the double guide wire technique. That's my choice uh, over the transpancreatic septotomy. And then we have pre-cut EUS guided rendezvous or alternative approaches uh, by our colleagues. Now, I have to say that um, what's throwing the double guide wire technique um, uh, out, out of the ballpark to a certain extent is the fact that there was uh, um, a, a number of trials um, that came out that showed that in fact, um, the double guide wire technique was associated with increased risk of uh, pancreatitis. Um, although what I thought was the best trial of a randomized controlled trial showed that uh, it was uh, certainly better for cannulation with no increased risk whatsoever, but a higher rate of cannulation. So um, I think that the, the jury is out on this. I can say that in my experience, um, uh, I still prefer the double guide wire technique. And as you've seen again, demonstrated earlier, um, you can see on the left, the double guide wire technique is of course, is when you get into the pancreatic duct, we leave the wire in the pancreatic duct and take a second wire or a second device to cannulate. Um, here you see it here. Uh, and now you can see, you know, the usual attempt uh, trying to get into the bile duct unsuccessfully, of course. And then as we continue to try to cannulate, we get into the pancreatic duct. So we leave that wire in the pancreatic duct and we go back with the sphincter atone. Now I should sort of pause here for a moment because you know there's there's a choice here you're at a choice between leaving a stent in the pancreatic duct a small five french stent and cannulating over that stent um or uh you could use a small transpancreatic sphincterotomy and then leave a stent in the pancreatic duct and then go to the bile duct um so basically uh in the studies that have been done really the, the, the best way to cannulate in the double guide wire technique is to just go with the wire alone in the pancreatic duct. And, uh, and that gives you much more room to uh, insert your sphincter atome and to go up into the bile duct. So we leave it in, you know, the, the wire is straightening out the anatomy for us. We're trying, you can see here, oftentimes the wire will flip back into the pancreatic duct so we have to change direction, bow up, bow up. And then with this double guide wire technique, we can see that uh, you get into the uh, common bile duct. Um, and in fact, we've used this the reverse. When we keep getting into the common bile duct and we want to get into the pancreatic duct, we've occasionally even left the uh, uh, wire in the uh, bile duct if, if we felt that that would change the orientation. It's all about being a allowing your mind and your hands to change orientation. If, if the basics don't work, then work your way around the clock. Uh, we've sometimes seen pancreatic ducts that come in at the 10 o'clock direction. So uh, every papilla is different. And when the basics don't work, you have to be willing to allow yourself to try different angles and different approaches. Um, so when the double guide wire technique uh, does not work, then you have, of course, uh, pre-cut techniques. And there are, are essentially um, sort of three types, if you like, of pre-cut techniques. Um, there's basically going from the orifice, which we've seen demonstrated, um, needle knife fistulotomy, which is going from the apex of the duodenal bulb, or the transpancreatic 
septo I call it a septotomy. So basically you're going into the pancreatic uh, orifice, but with only a small bit of wire cutting in the biliary direction to give you an approach to the bile duct. And I won't go into, again, uh, reemphasizing that whatever approach you take is highly dependent on the morphology of the papilla. So you can't say that fistula, there are papers which show that fistulotomy is better than going from the orifice. And the reason for that is you avoid the thermal damage or cutting of the pancreatic orifice and you reduce pancreatitis. Yes, in general, that's true with a large mound, certainly with a dilated duct. It's not true with a small flat papilla. So you have to adapt the approach to the uh, papillary morphology, no question about that. Here you can see again, um, our needle knife approach. Um, and, and again, it, 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 it's, I, you have to have very good visualization. And it is very careful uh, dissection, if you like. And you can see here, I'm even more careful than a meat. And um, this is an older video, uh, but we don't go very high. We go very slowly. And we try to sort of evert the folds, go a little bit deeper so we can see where we are. So we're not, it's not slash and burn. It's, it, it, you take your time. And what I often do, even if I don't see an orifice, I will put the sphincter tome into the cut surface and probe with the wire, which I did here. We ended up into the pancreas. And once we were there, it made our life easier because in the pre-cut technique, you're often better off having a stent in the pancreatic duct to protect it. Now it's much easier. I'm probing a little bit for the bile duct. Again, not much of a pre-cut. I'm going to go a little bit deeper and a little bit higher up. And with the stent in place, you have much more protection. Now you see that onion skin, the white surface of the muscle, if you like the, the, uh, uh, the sphincter muscle. And now we're going to go just a little bit higher up above that muscle. And we're going to probe with the wire and we get into the bile duct that way after the pre-cut. And then we extend the cut and do whatever, whatever therapy is necessary. So the, the principle is <clears throat> you have to go very carefully, very slowly, and, and layer by layer. And again, here's a fistulotomy demonstration. Uh, some nice images published last year by, again, the Yale New Haven group. Uh, but you can see here, you establish the axis of the papillary mound. In this case, it's a little bit distorted going up to the left. You carefully dissect through the mucosa and submucosa until you see that white, shiny white sphincteric mound. And then as you cut through the muscle, similarly to when you get a, let's say, uh, when you're doing a, a polypectomy in the colon, you see that brown muscle. So here we see brown muscle, and then you probe into that area through those fibers, and you'll get into the bile duct. So it's careful. Um, dissection layer by layer. Now, what about the challenge when you can't get in with the standard techniques? You've seen a lot of uh, illustrations of challenges of the uh, um, uh, diverticulum, the duodenal diverticula, and papilla within a diverticulum. Now, the majority of times we can see that, I would say 85% of the time, we see it along the lower rim between three o'clock and nine o'clock. And the majority tend to be on the right side, uh, more between three o'clock and six o'clock. Now, in this case, we had a very challenging diverticulum where the, we had the uh, palisading of folds uh, on top of each other within the diverticulum. And it was very, very difficult to find. We'll uh, play this video. We couldn't really find out where the orifice is. We have to probe. Uh, lifting up folds, trying to go from different angles, trying to insinuate ourselves into the diverticulum. So what we're doing here is there are many methods to try to change the orientation of the folds within a diverticulum. Um, the commonest method is either a two device method where you take a uh, pediatric alligator, grab the fold and push it down. And then you put your sphincter tone with the wire uh, alongside that 
in the channel of the duodenoscope. I find that to be very tricky. Um, so the other method we use is to use clips as you see here. And what we're trying to do is to grab the tissue with the clips and pull those folds out of the diverticulum to give us a chance to find the orifice. Now, and this is edited down, but we could not find the orifice that way. So now we're doing, of course, the rendezvous. You've seen that illustrated before. The rendezvous is not always easy, but when you have a very dilated duct, in this case, it was uh, certainly easier. So we go from the duodenum, uh, usually the duodenal cap. And what's critical is the orientation of the uh, echoendoscope with the bile duct, especially if the duct is not that dilated. So what happens is that oftentimes in the duodenum, uh, the uh, orientation of the needle puncture is towards the hilum, which is fine if you're doing a, um, a stent, uh, a transduodenal stent. But if we're trying to rendezvous, we want to get the orientation of the scope such that the needle entry is towards the papilla. So that's what we did here. We, we got our echoendoscope in the appropriate position for a rendezvous technique. And now as we're in this uh, particular position here, we're going to advance the wire down. And you can see here as we do that, the wire often will curl up. It's often difficult to get it to go down. And we finally, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And we finally push through uh, the papilla, or the, the papillary orifice. But then we had a second problem, which was the wire then curled up <clears throat> within the diverticulum which again made it difficult. But, but this is the type of thing we just deal with as we go. And then the next step, so we leave the wire, we pull the echoendoscope out. So now you have a wire which is going down through the stomach, through the duodenal wall and out through the papilla. Now we just go back down with the duodenoscope, we go into the duodenum and we grab uh, the wire. Uh, and you'll see here, we've got it now with a forceps. And we're going to pull that wire up through the duodenoscope. Now, at this choice, at this point in the rendezvous technique, you have a choice. You could put your instrument over that wire that you've rendezvoused with, but don't forget what's going to happen as you advance your papillotome, sphincterotome over that wire. The tip will be sitting against the entry point of the wire into the duct, which is about two centimeters up in D1, in the duodenum. So it's not a, an ideal way of having control of your sphincterotomy and your wire. So our preferred choice is to just use the wire as a guide and alongside that wire, we re-cannulate. So you see here, we have the wire, it shows us the direction and the wire holds the papilla out towards the scope. And then we can take the sphincterotome and go alongside that wire. And at that point, you can see uh, we have the wire here. This, this wire up here is coming through the stomach, through the duodenum wall, and out through the papilla. And we're going to insert a second wire, you can see going up there into the bile duct. And then once the second wire is in place and we're happy, we can obviously remove the first wire. Well, we kept it there until we had a little bit of a cut to ensure that we had access. And then we take that wire out and we completed uh, the therapy on, on this particular case. Uh, I think it was a big stone that we, or we may have put a stent in, that's right. So those are the rendezvous techniques. So I like to conclude my talk with a quote from virtually uh, almost a hundred years ago. And I think it applies now as much as it did then. This is Sir Barclay Moynihan in the Annals of Surgery, 1925. Acute pancreatitis is the most terrible of all the calamities that occur in connection with the abdominal viscera, the suddenness of its onset, the illimitable agony which accompanies it, and the mortality attendant upon it all render it the most formidable of catastrophes. So that's for us applies today. The catastrophe for us in the ERCP world is a terrible pancreatitis. Now, fortunately, with our newer approaches with um, hydration, with uh, Indesid or Sulindac and, and uh, 
uh, stents, we have, we have certainly cut back considerably, but in the back of your mind, at all times, when you are doing ERCP and cannulation, don't forget that everything you do may end up with a pancreatitis. So in the end, what you have to do is remember, you always have options. You can do, even with a pre-cut, 10, 20% of the time you go back, a separate session, a day or two later you get in. A different endoscopist. Refer to a specialist center if you're in a, a community or if you don't have that much experience, you're only doing you know, a couple of hundred ERCPs a year. Send it to somebody who does five, 600 a year. And of course, we've talked about rendezvous or at least addressed a little bit of that. And finally, we have certainly talented radiologists and surgical colleagues who can help us out. So just remember, it's always multidisciplinary. Recognize your own limitations. But on the other hand, uh, if you follow these guidelines, I'm sure you'll be very successful. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Haber. That was a fantastic lecture and a nice contrast to what we uh, heard from Amit earlier. So now uh, my co-moderator from Thailand, uh, Dr. Rungsen and I, again, we want to congratulate Truptesh and Amol for kicking off this fantastic series on ERCP cannulation. Uh, as you've seen, no matter how long you've been doing it, it's something that can humble all of us. And now we're going to present a few cases that are going to highlight many of the topics that were covered uh, in the wonderful lectures that you just heard. We're supposed to go a little quick, but I'm hoping the panel um, will interact with us and uh, discuss some of these cases. Okay, so my first case is a double wire cannulation. As uh, Dr. Haber mentioned, that is a technique that I utilize quite frequently uh, to aid with biliary cannulation. This was a 70 year old patient. He had a history of a Bill Roth II uh, decades ago for peptic ulcer disease. Now he's having intermittent right upper quadrant pain, mildly elevated liver enzymes that prompted imaging that showed a dilated bile duct with a distal uh, CBD stone. So, just for the panel, you know, when you're thinking about doing a Bill Roth II case, we can just start with what's your scope of choice to start with? Greg or Amit, if you want to comment. Yeah. Nowadays, we see Bildrot 2 very uncommonly, actually. We used to see it very often in the past. Uh, we had two choices. One is either you can attempt to directly with the duodenoscope if it's a short loop Bildrot 2. And, uh, and if your duodenoscope is passing easily, you can attempt it. Otherwise, I usually we used to prefer a pediatric colonoscope. And with a pediatric colonoscope, it was quite easy to reach the, the apparent limb and reach the papilla in the reverse <clears throat> direction. So that is, these are my choices. All right, can you see my no. slide now? I would say, uh, Uzma, then I, I generally prefer a duodenoscope. And, uh, and that's usually because of the having the elevator and the ability to manipulate the direction of cannulation, obviously. Um, I would say that it depends on the length of the limb as to what works most easily. Uh, when they do Bill Roth II, you can go anti-colic or retrocolic with your uh, afferent limb. When it's um, uh, retrocolic, uh, it uh, tends to be um, uh, a little bit shorter and then the uh, duodenoscope uh, can often get there. But there's a higher risk of perforation with the duodenoscope. So in that sense, uh, the colonoscope is safer. Great, but uh, what about if you have training in your system, would you prefer them to go ahead with the standard scope or dual scope? Because that's one of our problems here. If we have training, I usually allow them to go with the standard scope instead of dual scope. Yeah, but do you use a gastro gastroscope? Uh, wrong yeah. wrong a gastroscope or colonoscope? Yes, because with, with training to, to, uh, uh, to be the first perform, uh, you know, endoscopist for those cases. Okay. But also, if it is a short limb, I tend to start with a therapeutic upper scope myself. Uh, and you'll see in my video, this has a distal attachment cap. Again, just to see how sharp the angulation is uh, in the afferent limb, especially right when you get towards the end near the papilla. Sometimes that can be a little difficult to navigate with the duodenoscope. So I usually go with an upper scope, get the lay of the land, and then I'll try with a side viewer. In this particular case, I, I had a little trouble maneuvering uh, the side viewing scope. So I did go with a, a therapeutic upper scope with the distal attachment cap, which helps you isolate the papilla. 
uh, typically, you know, we go to the end of, of the limb and then I start pulling back. Oops, we'll just go back real quick to show the papilla. So as most everyone uh, in the audience already knows and definitely our panel, you know, when you're trying to do biliary cannulation, the bile duct runs at a five, six o'clock position. Um, so ideally that's where you wanna get in. Uh, we'll ask the panel, what's your favorite tome uh, to try to cannulate a Bill Roth II case with? Greg? Um, so with Bill Roth II, I generally go Cannula. with a 10. Sorry, yeah. So with Bill Roth II, I generally go with a um, cannula uh, tandem catheter with it wired. So it's usually a, a straight, if, I, if I'm going with a forward viewing scope, then I want a very straight takeoff of the wire for the bile duct. Amit, any preference? Yeah, yeah. Uh, even I will use a, a, a straighter cannula and try to enter with a straight wire rather than a curved wire because now this is going to be a straight pathway towards five o'clock when you're coming from this direction. But as far as the sphincterotome is concerned, then in that case, I will use a rotatable sphincterotome because ideally we used to use a build rod to sphincterotome. There's something called as a build rod to sphincterotome, which used to be manufactured in the past, which had a wire in the opposite direction. And it was a push type sphincterotome, not pull type. So when you push it, the wire used to come out and then you cut towards the five o'clock. Otherwise you can use an autotome from Boston Scientific. You can rotate in the opposite direction and then you can cut towards the five o'clock. So one option is go in with a straight wire cannula, put a wire, and over that you can do a needle knife sphincter. Or some sometimes you can put a, a some which makes it a little safer too to see the direction. Put a, a biliary stent and then needle knife over that as well. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We did have a B two tome here. Um, initially, I did get into the what ended up being the PD with a little too vigorous injection, sadly, but um, but then I left the wire in place and then we got into the, the bile duct with the, the B2 tome. And the, it, the bile duct was dilated around 15, 16 millimeters and there was a stone uh, that I dislodged from the distal duct up higher. And then with the B2 tome, we can perform a biliary sphincterotomy Usma, what is your uh, direction to you know uh, place your you know, catheter over the first guy? Why? Any recommendation? Um, well, you know, if the the you mean the first guide wire being in the PD, so then I want to still aim lower for the B two papilla, and again, then cut kind of in the five six o'clock position. And I'm just going kind of slowly and just making sure when I push up against it, just making sure I still see. Uh, the roof of the mound there to try to know when to stop cutting. And then because the stone was fairly large, I did do uh, a dilation and then went in with the mechanical lithotripter to crush the stone. At this point, I still have a wire in the PD, but we're gonna lose that shortly. And then we use a balloon. And then I guess the question would be for the panel, in a case where you had a PD wire in, during the course of your, your biliary maneuvers, you lose the PD wire. You know, at that point, you did have one injection of the PD. Would you reattempt to put a PD stent in or would you just cut your losses at that point and get out? And I guess we'll do two scenarios. One is if Look you did inject the PD versus one was just a wire only. Well, I'll listen. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and say that I, I certainly wouldn't attempt to cannulate again if you had you had one sort of injection. Um, so I, I myself would not continue, especially given the difficulty. Um, so, but that would be my approach. I, I have to say that that was an incredible case, Uzma. I mean, that is a tour de force to be able to get that stone out. Um, I myself am not a great fan of the, uh, the push or the B2 sphincterotome. I find that uh, it's very hard to control, um, get the wire in the right direction. I mean, you showed it beautifully. Um, uh, I, I tend to find what's more pragmatic for me is to put a stent into the bile duct and do a needle knife over the stent 
and then to use balloon dilation sphincteroplasty uh, to get the uh, adequate orifice for stone removal. And, and the only question I would throw back at you, Uzma, is uh, for the mechanical lithotripter, was that a standard colonoscope? Because I think you would need, what, a 3.2 channel? No, no, it was a, this was all done with the therapeutic upper scope. Oh, therapeutic upper scope. So you had a yeah. 3.7 channel. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Yeah, that's Beautiful. why I, I always use the therapeutic channel scope because, again, for your different devices, you don't want to be limited. Um, right. But I, I find it works pretty well. Beautiful. No, I, and a, I agree. The B2 tome, it's great when it lines up perfectly, but yes, it doesn't always do so. That's why this is the video I'm showing. Uzma <laughs> Amulier. <laughs> so just to play the devil's advocate. Now, you know, we all have done our B2 cases earlier, but now with the EOS guided interventions coming up so and becoming so commonplace, you know, what's your, you know, threshold to do an EOS guided left duct or, you know, access rather than to go into a difficult B2 kind of a situation and do a retrograde ERCP through a B2? Meaning it's a question to you as well as to the rest of the panel. I mean, I would say in general for me to do any kind of transmural access or drainage, I pretty much limit it mainly to patients who have malignancy. In this case, you know, this is a benign stone case. And so I would not uh, do any uh, US guided uh, maneuvers, typically, typically. Okay. Yeah, even I agree with Uzma Amul. Uh, in this particular case, uh, if at all you take a US guided approach, it will be only if you cannot cannulate the ampulla, maybe just to take a wire from up. And you can you can see the ampulla and just get the wire and then complete your procedure, because it is a stone case and then with US guided you can't anyway complete it. Uh, if it was just a stent, then US guided maybe we could have placed a stent. Uh, as far as your B two sphincterotome is concerned, uh, uh, that direction uh, what you did was excellent. And uh, regarding the stent in the trying to cannulate the pancreas again, if only a wire goes inside, I don't think it's necessary to keep on cannulating the pancreas and try to get a stent. But looking at the contrast which you injected, I will make an attempt to try to put a pancreatic stent. I know the for me the injection we I did have I do have assistants helping me. I tend to practice like an Eastern doc, so it was a little vigorous for me. So I did uh, place a PD stent. But my philosophy is always I'll give it one or two tries at the end of the case, um, especially if I have an injection. But I will not linger on it if I can get it in. Great. If not, we'll move on. So, but okay, that's my case. And now we'll have Dr. Rungson present uh, his case. Thank just you. just before you leave, can I make yeah. a comment? Um, yes. A couple of things about the scope in, in B2 or altered anatomy. Um, if you're using a colonoscope I mean, or, or any scope, I think often for cannulation, you want to be able to do what looked like you were doing with just kind of a J maneuver uh, in that uh, second part of the duodenum. So you're actually trying to mimic a prograde approach. And um, the type of scope that will allow that to be done with a very short radius of curvature is either the... Um, a double balloon system, of course, the with the short double balloon scope, which is a, it's a, a 9.5 millimeter scope that will retroflex. But now we have the PCFTL, which is a short bending colonoscope from Olympus, which again, if you're going to use a, a forward viewing um, and you want to use a colonoscope, um, that will also allow uh, retroflexion, if you like, within the duodenum. So these are good alternatives. Agree. I think you have, just have to be ready to use different types of scopes when you're dealing with uh, altered anatomy. So I think that's probably the biggest message or take home. But whichever scope you use should have a therapeutic channel. Otherwise, you will not yes. be able to pass accessories easily because yes. this is a little longer pathway. Yeah. Okay. I, this, I agree. I agree with Amit. I mean, there's certainly the limitations of uh, the the TL PCFTL or the uh, uh, even the the uh, double loom system and the maximum channel size is 3.2. Yeah. Well, and also, again, the length comes into play with, with your different devices. So if I can get there with a, a therapeutic upper, 
Um, again, I usually look first with that just so I know the anatomy. Sometimes I'll leave a guide wire to help me under floral get my side viewing scope there. Um, sure. But then I'll back up to that T1 scope. Right. I think Rangsan, you're all set with your. Hey, I, can you see my slide now? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is the case of 10 years old girl who got tropical uh, mm -hmm. chronic pancreatitis, it's common in our area. Uh, and she had uh, uh, cannulation uh, of the pancreatic duct via major papilla earlier, uh, a couple of years ago, and we cleaned her duct uh, uh, with the standard therapy. At that time, luckily, it was an uh, over soft stone. So we were able to remove all the stone. But unfortunately, two years later, she came back with recurrent pancreatitis with pain that required, you know, uh, uh, continuous uh, injection of morphine. And we repeat CT scan and we found that she got uh, the dilation of the dorsal duct. And in this case, uh, we confirmed with the uh, uh, radiologist, this is reverse pancreas division. So we think that we might want uh, to have to clear her uh, minor papilla. I mean, uh, the, this very short dorsal duct that uh, contains some stone. And as you can see that, uh, even the, we try with the guy Y uh, through this very, very uh, small opening of the minor papilla, we could not achieve it. And unfortunately, we did not have the needle tip, uh, you know, catheter like Amit has demonstrated. So uh, I just want to get any recommendation from you guys. Fail. So Rangsan, is this, is this in communication with the main, with the, uh, the main duck? No. Or, or is it no, unfortunately not. It's com completely separate system. Completely Only separate. Yes. Oh. No. But but you can see the dilated duct over there, right? On right. your CT scan, on the CT okay. scan. Exactly. And we try, actually we went through the major papilla and we tried to use balloon occlusion through the, uh, that pancreatic duct. Uh, could not get to this dorsal or, uh, you know, the secluded segment. Any Listen, I, I think your options are, of course, whatever devices you can use. I mean, if you can see the orifice clearly uh, and you're convinced that's the minor papilla, and, but I'm assuming you couldn't even get a small 018 wire or 021 wire through the orifice. Is that the issue, Runsung? Yeah, we could. We, we just, uh, you know, as you can see, this is the opening of the uh, major papilla, and then we, when we move up, it's only the prominent minor papilla, and yeah. we did try this, and that's all we got. We, we thought we'd be probably in the opening, but with that guy wide, uh, we could not get through that. Yeah, this so I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, I mean, if you consider, we would consider a rendezvous with a a wire from the stomach into the dilated uh, pancreatic duct, yes. but 10 year old girl going, yeah. you know, the, the good thing is she has chronic pancreatitis. So she's probably not as reactive uh, in terms of needling her. It's not like needling a, or putting a, a catheter or burning through a normal pancreas. So the options are a needle knife of the minor or a rendezvous. Yeah, but it's actually, First, we try with EUS, but unfortunately, this is only the dilated duct, only the hit of the pancreas. So, oh could not see. Yeah. Unfortunately, you're right. Yeah. You I couldn't see from the stomach so well. Yeah, too far. No, too yeah, far. Yeah, actually, a smaller wire, smaller wire, 543 catheter. And if not, then you're going to probably have to needle knife if you couldn't do the EUS access. Uh, I will not. I personally don't believe that you can do a needle knife for a minor papilla because, as the bile duct, where you know where the axis of the bile duct is in minor papilla, you never know where the axis of the pancreatic duct is. Yeah. When you see the minor yeah, papilla, even, so, so, even yeah. when it's not, when it's to the dome, it's still hard to tell the borders. But Rangsan seems yeah, capable. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would. I wouldn't do the type of needle knife that you do, Amit. You're a great. <laughs> You're a, you're a confident needle knifer. I'm a very, very <laughs> cautious needle knifer. We had no choice. I'm, I'm similar. I'm similar to Greg. I was impressed by that one. You just went for it. You just, you know, <laughs> boom. No <laughs> choice, so, Greg. So this, I don't know. I guess this could be the direction. So to be safe, I cut from the top downward to the opening. 
Now, I have to say that there is a direction generally of the minor papilla. That's the nine o'clock direction. So when you're going for the pancreas, it's generally nine o'clock. You're more or less 10 or 11 there, but that is the direction. Yeah, Rangsani's inside. <laughs> wow, that is, that is fantastic. We got in, we, we saw the flag came out uh, by the time we cut, uh, you know, and then I think the reason that we could not get in because there was a stricture. Even the, the, the cadre could not get in. So we have to, you know, push very hard. And uh, this is what we got and some amorphous material. You know, even that, we love to go with the spy. <laughs> so it was such a short, the duct was so short, Rangsan? Not short. going beyond. I could get in only in about three or four centimeters from the orifice. But, but so even, I see uh, that's no. what So even that was symptomatic, huh? Because of the stones? Yes, she got better. And yeah. Right. Yes. So what, what you call the reverse divisor more an isolated short segment dorsal duct. I mean, I've only seen that rarely. Is that, do you see that very often, Ransan? I mean. No, no. actually, it's my, my first test. I mean, usually what happened is, it is a more like acquired division or reverse division, oh. but it, it, it oh. could be the, you know, the, I don't know, it's from, because it's only, uh, 10 years old, so probably yeah. congenital. And she got yeah, pain. But, yeah, and the good, this is good the part is that she earlier, had... But, yeah, yeah. Because she had chronic pancreatitis, uh, I mean, even if you're a little aggressive here, it's unlikely to cause a major reaction, like pancreatitis. Yeah. Amazing case. Full blow, full, amazing case. Excellent, Excellent. demonstration. Excellent. Uh, so before uh, we jump on to the next uh, case, uh, in uh, constraint of times, there are a few questions that uh, Amol and I will just go through. This is audience questions to the panelists and also to the moderators. So one of our uh, audience is asking, we don't have elevators in therapeutic endoscopy. How to overcome it for cannulation, the risk of losing your wires? So it's open to our panelists as well as the experts. I, I didn't understand. We don't have? I think he's saying with the, the therapeutic yeah. upper scope, you don't have enough. endoscope, upper scope, you don't have cannula, the elevator. So how to prevent from losing the wires? Well, we keep on doing fluoroscopy every now and then. Uh, I agree. But I mean, uh, to, to our practice, I didn't have time to mention about that. We usually try to get in with the standard gastroscope and then we place the guy Y just inside the, the, the alim and uh, you know, went back in with unoscope. So it's better for, for us to do cannulation. But if it's the case, I think we have no choice. But luckily, this is V2. So you probably uh, have more straightforward shot to the bida when you get in. Yeah, one of the reasons is because you're going in a little long loop, the ultimate the scope position becomes much more stable. And that's why your wires don't come out so easily. Yeah. That's I guess also just, you know, communication with your assistant and intermittent fluoroscopy, uh, just to be aware you don't have the elevator. So maybe you go a little bit slower with your exchange. Yeah, I, I agree with all of the above. And I would say in the West, we have to communicate every, se every second. Look at the wire. Don't let the wire move. Watch the wire. Don't hold the wire. So, wire, wire, and wire. We do. We do. I just, I just don't stop talking. Well, no, I have them. I have them tell tell me back. We're uh, you know giving tension, pulling back, pulling back. I mean, it's a constant. And, yeah, and and Greg in the east, the the assistant is communicating with the endoscope. He's telling us, "You do this. You do that." Yes. I know. I always I always remember that in Brussels with, with Michelle Kramer in the old days and Jacques Devier. Their assistants told them to do everything. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So there is another question from one of our audience uh, participant attendees. Infiltrative adenocarcinoma of the papilla. How do you cannulate the, the papilla in these situations? Now, the, you know, Dr. Maidev, Dr. Heber, and then, of course, uh, Rangsan Guzma. Each one of you all, probably a quick one-liner. What, what do you think is the best way to go in this case? Okay, let me go first. I allow my train to do only once and that's it. Otherwise, there will be some contact bleeding. And then I would try to go to the most ulcerative area, but usually at the top part of the tumor. 
that's my you know the attempt but this day we got eu as rendezvous so i i don't worry that uh, anymore okay i mean i think so you still approach the papilla in the same fashion as you normally do but I do agree, you have to worry about uh, contact bleeding. And especially if you're gonna needle knife into a tumor, uh, you can create false tracks more easily. So, you know, perhaps you might go to EUS rendezvous a little bit sooner uh, if you can't get in easily with a standard tone. I would just reemphasize that in ampular adenomas or early carcinomas, the orifice is often at the upper end, which Runsung was saying, because the tumor tends to uh, develop sort of in a, in a downstream direction from the papilla. Yes, yeah, so we are talking about we are talking about ampullary tumors, right? Amol? Ampullary, uh, ampullary pancreas, and probably yeah, infiltrative, or, 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 whatever. Or in, infiltrative. See, because two are different. If it's a yeah. proliferative ampullary tumor, it's a different ball game. Because you keep on poking, you'll just cause bleeding. So you carefully observe until you see some greenish area somewhere. And that's what Greg said. It's usually above. Try to go and gently probe there with a glide wire. And in infiltrative adenocarcinomas of the pancreas, which are infiltrating the ampulla, this is an ideal scenario with the most difficult cannulation, where I think a US guided rendezvous will come and help. All right. Excellent. We'll have uh, Dr. Siddiqui present the next case. One last case, and we have to go quick. I don't want you guys to think I only do ERCPs with therapeutic uppers, but this is another scenario where <laughs> the patient was 88. Um, they're not a good historian, weight loss, painless jaundice. He said she had some sort of horrible ulcer disease that required some sort of repair in the past. We didn't know for sure what was going on. When we passed an upper down, she had a very deformed pylorus that was stenotic with a foreshortened uh, proximal duodenum, almost like she had some sort of repair there. Uh, with a very limited sweep and you saw the ampulla. Uh, so then I ended up putting, uh, I couldn't get a side viewer scope through that area due to the angulation, despite dilating, despite uh, changing the patient's position. So then I opted for putting uh, a 20 millimeter Axios because it seemed like a benign stricture that was semi-pliable. And then I dilated that. And then I still couldn't get the side viewer down to make that angulation uh, to look at the papilla. So then again, I went with a therapeutic upper scope, identified the papilla. This case was really tough though, because my angle of the papilla was quite high and it was really hard to get that without an elevator. After trying for a little bit, again, different tomes, wires, I was able uh, to finally get a wire into the PD. And then I did try to do a, a double wire technique and cannulate next to it, but that was unsuccessful as well. So then for me, if I'm gonna do a needle knife, ideally I like to do it over a pancreatic duct stent. And you already saw many examples of how to do that, but this is my gentle technique from the West. I just cut a little bit, then I put the knife back, <laughs> try the wire, and then, you know, as Greg said, kind of peel the onion and work your way in. Because otherwise, sometimes I worry, you know, you're going to make a false tract and then you're, you're lost. So here you see, I finally got in. She has a very short, tight, distal uh, bile duct stricture. On EUS, she had a small two centimeter pancreas head mass, actually. So then uh, I exchanged out for a sphincter tome completed the, the biliary sphincterotomy. For some reason, I stopped the video here, but uh, I was able to get in a metal stent uh, and you see it through the, the axios. But, you know, this brings up the whole topic of, you know, handling the bile duct when you have duodenal obstruction and whether it's benign uh, versus malignant, and then what are your different options for, for getting biliary drainage? Excellent case. Well, <laughs> excellent case because this is really creditable, uh, Uzma. First of all, you used an end viewing scope, then you encountered difficulty at the duodenum. Then your state which you had placed was pressing your ampulla down. In spite of that, you cannulated the ampulla with the end viewing scope without an elevator and then did a pre-cut over the stent with the end viewing scope and finally completed your therapy with a stent. 
So it's the most challenging but very nicely demonstrated case, I should say. But if you ask exactly, me, what is that's our? That's how long it took. What, two minutes. <laughs> wow. But, <laughs> but but you know that's always the problem when you have these sharp angulations, and sometimes again, it's not the diameter of the turn; it's just that angulation. And so uh, again, that that was the biggest trouble for me in that case. <laughs> Just, uh, uh, just, just a quick you know, comment, <clears throat> a, a tour de force, no question. I mean, that was a spectacular case. I, I would put out a, a little bit of warning. Um, one of my colleagues this year um, had a similar situation with a foreshortened duodenum and a very short stricture, put a lambs in place. And, um, uh, and then uh, I think ran in trouble, decided uh, he would uh, come back. It was a malignant obstruction, but no, it wasn't a malignant obstruction. But the bottom yeah. line was that the lambs, the compression of the papillary mound from the lambs cause acute necrotizing pancreatitis. Wow. And unfortunately, that patient died from the pancreatitis. Oh. From, from the bottom end of the lambs compressing the papilla. Now, in your case, it's totally different. You had a stent in the pancreas. You had a stent in the bile duct. I'm not saying that's and similar. I could, I could visualize the whole uh, papilla. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not. No, you, yours is great, but I, I always think it's good yeah. to remind people of what can go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But now, what, if you what, were, I was going to say, yeah, if you encounter, what, what if, um, sorry, sorry, a, a no, you malignant, go, go ahead, go ahead. If you encounter a malignant duodenal obstruction, you know, would your options be to put a duodenal stent, wait? come back, try to do the ERCP once it's open? Would you immediately think I'm gonna uh, do EUS guided access through the bulb or through the stomach um, or IR? I guess those are your, your various options if it was malignant. If it's a malignant infiltration, I will perhaps first try gentle C CRE dilation of that stricture and try to dilate it up to 12 mm, then slowly 15 mm, and try to very gently maneuver ERCP duodenoscope through till the ampulla operator. Now, if in spite of two or three attempts of this is not going to be possible, my uh, preference is not to place a duodenal stent and go through it and try to do an ERCP. I will straight away go for a US guided approach. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, I think that uh, if you have obstruction, um, if it's a question of you need a duodenal stent because of gastric outlet obstruction, I would put it in and have a look, but I think if it's a very difficult, if you have a malignant involvement and the papilla is very difficult, I feel much safer doing a coligoco duodenostomy, put your stent in through the duodenal cap, and then putting in your uh, duodenal stent for GOO or gastrojedge, whatever you prefer. But I think I'm very short threshold to do a coligoco duodenostomy. Do you have any? Uh discussion with the surgeons or oncologists prior to making that call? With, say if you didn't have a plan yet for, for surgery, any concerns with uh, transmural drainage in those cases? Well, I think there is, if, if there is gonna be planned surgery, if, if the patient is an operative candidate, I think you do have to consider the options, early surgery, or you don't wanna interfere with surgery, et cetera. So I think that's a very good point. But even if surgery has to be done, you can put a short, fully covered metal stent across the lower block, and then they can go ahead with the pimples or a surgical procedure. In, in, in the Far East, we are more of uh, leaning toward uh, EUS guided for, you know, gastrochechinostomy uh, and HGS. That's probably the mainstay in, in the Far East. Even for benign cases, sometimes we try to do gastrochechinostomy and come back as like B2 cases and then take out the lamps later. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, and th there are a couple of other questions from the audience that I would like to uh, just take up. So, I think several of the participants, attendees have asked on uh, asked regarding the double wire technique versus pre cut over the pancreatic duct stent for biliary cannulation. So, Dr. Haber did mention his preference over about the double wire technique, but we would like to hear from the others, Dr. Maidev. And Uzma and Rangsan, you can quickly give maybe your preference whether whether you would use a double wire versus you know a stent and a pre-cut over a stent. Double wire. 
My quick answer is double Y because of we have training involved and we don't allow them to do pre-cut. Even, even I'm in favor of double Y because double Y invariably succeeds. Invariably. Yeah. Excellent. So Excellent. I have a question. Uh, I would take the privilege as, uh, so question is how often do you all, the panelists and the experts, you do a transpapillary septotomy, that is a golf. During a Never. Class. I was going to uh, say, very rarely, I, I, you still worry about pancreatitis, um, but not really, unless I'm very desperate. In China and uh, Korea, that's why it's a concern. But there are some, some endoscopists from US also who have described this. In fact, the video which I showed, which I borrowed from uh, the endoscopist from the Emory University from US, and they have described it in the GI video, video GI. So that, that's because I personally big, don't do it. So that's China. Do the Kai. Yeah, he is, he is from China. <laughs> I, I would say oh. that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Dr. He's Kai, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, no I'm the outlier. I'm the outlier. I believe that trans uh, pancreatic septotomy is very effective, very good, and uh, very appropriate in a very small papilla. Um, so that I think that the, the real issue is that you have to make a very short cut. I mean, you're only, you know, you're talking about a couple of millimeters, you have to have good control. All you're trying to do is change the angle of approach to get into the bile duct. So, I, I, I mean, listen, I don't use it often, but I would say uh, I'm not worried about it. And, um, and, and I will use it. And of course, afterwards, uh, preferentially leave a stent in the pancreatic duct. So Dr. Haber, question from the audience as well. What would be the direction of your tome while doing the golf? Well, listen, everyone says they want to go in the biliary direction. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, uh, the given. But the problem is when you're in the pancreatic duct, you can't always rotate to the biliary direction. So you have to go as close as you can. Now, uh, you know, when you push to a long scope, it will rotate the sphincter tome towards the biliary direction, which that can help also. So I think if you can't, we try the biliary direction, we can't get it. The trick is a very, very short cut. And even after one or two millimeters, then again, try for the bile duct because you're just changing uh, you know, slightly the direction of the tip of the palpital. Excellent. Yeah, I, I completely question. agree. We have one more question for Amol and then uh, we can wrap up the session. Okay, so there was one question, you know, I can probably club both of these. So what matters more, whether you use a long, route, long, long loop or a short loop, or getting the papilla end phase for cannulation, whether that is more important. And uh, also, do you have a preference of where do you keep the papilla for an easy bile duct cannulation, which side, where on the screen should the papilla be positioned? So th these are some questions that the audience have asked. So uh, would you like so to- Long loop and short loop for, for what type of cannulation? My major papilla or minor papilla? Major? Any papilla, in fact, major also, sometimes if you're not getting it fa face on, is it easier? Then semi-long look, semi-long look. Semi -long yeah. Look. So probably I think getting the axis correct is important. Yes. If you're getting the axis correct in the short, it doesn't matter, meaning of course you go ahead correct. with short, but otherwise you get it long, meaning. Correct. correct. What it would be an entail. And, and in the field, the papilla should be at 11 o'clock, uh, somewhere at uh, upper part of the field, somewhere on the left side. That should be the ideal direction and rotate the small in wheel in such a way that the bulge bulging portion of the papilla is facing from left to the right. Okay. From above downwards. Right. Yes. And, and, and then you get, your tome and you get your little kind a little bit of U shape going up into the hopefully yeah. right yeah. biliary direction. Right. Any 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 recommendations for cannulation of a floppy papilla? Oh, the Sharpe yeah. papilla. I think the key is. Again, you saw all those anatomy pictures. You do not want to jam your tome in, and then you're just going to kind of collapse the mucosal uh, area, and you're never going to get into the actual duct. So you have to kind of probe gently, almost pull back to get above the septum and get your wire um, into the bile duct. So that's the key, especially with fellows. You see, they just jam the tome in, and they think that's going to, and just go up, and they think that's going to work, but it has to be a little bit more delicate. Floppy papilla, never push the sphincterotome. Always cannulate with a wire and only let the wire enter inside gently first. Because if you push, the papilla is gone inside. Nothing you can see. 
then it, you'll not be able to succeed. Dr. Haber? Well, listen, I agree with all of that. <clears throat> I would also say with the Kolidoka seal, again, you, you, the, the, the real issue is not pushing and it's following the natural direction. And sometimes um, using your wire very early on, just going just into the mouth, use a very floppy hydrophilic wire. <clears throat> in that situation, sometimes even an angled wire and try to get in that way. Excellent. So with this, um, we would like to wrap up the session, but, uh, and, but before that, I would like to thank Dr. Medev, Dr. Haber, Dr. Rangsang, and Dr. Siddiqui for taking out time bearing with us with the glitch, with the daytime light, uh, daylight time saving, getting onto the Zoom. But uh, it was a great session, great inaugural session, and we wanted to pay tribute to our mentors. So Amol uh, paid his tribute to his mentor. And uh, as, as for me, I'm very much uh, privileged to have Dr. Heber. And above all, it's uh, Uzma and Rangsan, you did great. I would like to thank the attendees and also Medtronic and Boston uh, Scientific uh, in order to sponsor and also help us uh, get this program running. I will hand over to Amol for the final uh, uh, wrap up and the, for the upcoming session, which is coming up in November. All right, so thanks once again, all the panelists, all the faculty, as well as all the attendees. And again, once again, a sincere apology for the goof up regarding the time zones, but uh, uh, we still managed to have quite a few attendees, <laughs> but those who could not because of the time zone difference or because of whatever other reasons, we have good news because the recording of this webinar will be available on the free endoscopy YouTube channel. I'm sure you all have all registered for the YouTube channel updates and uh, you all will be able to access this webinar even for later review, you know, viewing and for this thing for uh, attending that and I'm sure you all will enjoy doing that. The other important thing is that uh, if uh, you all have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do so because there are a lot of other, you know, educational videos and, you know, uh, on endoscopy techniques which are available on over here so that uh, you all can definitely uh, get, uh, keep getting updates about those things. The other thing is, we know that some of the questions in the audience box, uh, audience questions could not be answered live, but we will answer them, uh, you know, uh, after the session because uh, we don't want to extend the session beyond the time, but we will make sure that these questions do get answered. The third thing is the next session now. So the next session we have, Truptesh and I, we have planned and we have envisioned that we will have a session every three months or so. So the next session is going to be on, now let me share my slide. So the next session is going to be on another very important and very, you know, commonplace topic that is of EMR, colonic EMR, when and how. So th please mark your dates, November 12th. And this time the time zone is correct. I checked that with Ruptesh as well. So it will be daylight saving at that time. And so, so it will be 7.30 in the evening on Saturday in India. And it will be 9 a.m. in New York at that time. And obviously the rest of the world follows, you know, accordingly. So those things will be there. So keep watching this space and, you know, uh, for the details of this webinar, the faculty who are going to be involved in that. And... Uh, of course, this was uh, the first time that we had this webinar, this East meets West session. We hope to have more of these in subsequent, uh, you know, sessions. But we would love to hear back from you, from all the attendees, from all the panel, the faculty, all of y'all, how we could do better. Of course, we can definitely and we will do better regarding the announcing the times or times. But even in other, many other ways, how we could do better regarding choice of topics, as well as how it could be conducted better so that, you know, the participants can benefit out of that. So we would love to hear from you. So please give your feedback on our, uh, you know, on today's webinar. And once again, I think with this, I would like to sign off, but not before thanking all of y'all again to, for taking time off on a Saturday 
for this uh, wonderful meeting thank you so much